Okay, when you think about the pyramids, you probably picture them you know, gleaming white, right? Mm -hmm. Those amazing casing stones reflecting the sun. Absolutely. The classic image, pure pharaonic power on display. But what if that stunning look wasn't the only reason for them? What if those stones did something else, something structural? That's exactly what we're diving into. We've got this really interesting Twitter thread that challenges that whole just for show idea. Right. So we're going to unpack the arguments, look at the evidence the author presents. Think of this as your shortcut to a pretty mind bending theory. We'll start with the standard view, then get into some cool experiments the author did with uh, making their own limestone. Plus ancient records, chemical analysis. It sounds like there might be a hidden story locked inside those stones. Let's get into it. OK, so the traditional explanation is pretty straightforward, really. High quality white limestone from the Turquoise make the pyramids shine, show off the pharaoh's glory. Standard stuff. Exactly. Nice, bright, white stone, quarried, shaped, and fitted to create that perfect gleaming surface it would have been incredible to see. And Tura wasn't exactly close, was it? About 15 miles away? Yeah, roughly. So hauling all that high-grade stone was a huge effort in itself. Which, you know, underlines how important that look must have been, at least in the conventional view. Precisely. It emphasizes the value placed on that outer shell. But this Twitter thread we're looking at asks, was it just about looks? Right. The, the, the author kind of flags this, acknowledges the gleaming image, but admits they'd suspected something more was going on. And it seems like actually doing some experiments, making artificial limestone was key for them. That's fascinating. So moving beyond just theory and getting hands on, what did they do? Well, they basically made two batches of synthetic limestone, different recipes. Okay. One used a formula linked to Imhotep, or at least researched by Joseph Davidovitz, using natron as the binder, you know, natural salts that become sodium hydroxide. Uh -huh. And the second oh. one, the second was the author's own recipe, using ashlai instead. So potassium hydroxide as the binder. Two different binders. Then what? The durability test? Yep. They let them dry for uh, about 10 days, then dunk them both in water for 24 hours straight. And the results? Pretty dramatic, actually. The ashlai version, the potassium hydroxide one, it came out totally fine, held together perfectly. OK. And the other one, the natron-based one? That one. Well, it basically fell apart, crumbled quite badly after being submerged. Wow. That's a huge difference. So the immediate thought is... The immediate thought is, if the inner blocks of the pyramid were made with something like that natron-based mix, they'd be really vulnerable to water, wouldn't they? Yeah, absolutely. Rain, maybe groundwater seepage over time. Yeah. It wouldn't hold up. So suddenly you have a really practical reason for needing a tough, water-resistant outer layer. The casing stones become essential protection. It wasn't just about looking good. It was about keeping the core structure safe and dry. That's the author's argument based on this experiment. It suggests a functional need beyond just aesthetics, even allowing for, you know, age and full curing time. The difference points to a real weakness. OK, that's a compelling idea based on the experiment. Yeah. But, but is there any, like, historical evidence that hints at this? Well, this brings us to the Diary of Mirror, which was a fantastic find back in 2013. Oh, yeah, I remember hearing about that. A <laughs> logbook from someone actually involved in the pyramid construction. Exactly. Found at a Red Sea harbor. Mirror recorded transporting stone for the Great Pyramid, the horizon of Khufu, as they called it. And this Twitter thread picks up on specific entries. It does. Entries from days 26 to 29 mention trips back and forth from Tura carrying stone. But day 29 has this phrase. Which is? Inspector Mirror spent the day collecting stones in Tura South. The author puts an exclamation mark there emphasizing collecting. Collecting. Hmm. Like you collect pebbles or firewood. Not giant. Perfectly cut blocks. Precisely the author's point. You collect rubble, aggregate, maybe powder. Loose materials, you don't usually say you collect massive quarried blocks. So the suggestion is maybe Merer wasn't hauling finished casing stones from Tura. Maybe he was hauling the ingredients to make them on site near the pyramid, like the raw limestone rubble or powder needed for an artificial stone mix. That completely changes the picture from just quarrying and shipping finished pieces. It really does. If they were manufacturing the casing stones near the pyramid, it opens up questions about what exactly they were made of. Which leads us neatly into the chemical side of things, the actual makeup of the casing stone. Yep. And here the author brings in work by Joseph Davidovitz, specifically an XRF study, X-ray fluorescence. OK, what well, then tell us? It compares the chemistry of the casing stones to limestone samples taken directly from the Tura quarries. And there are differences. Like what? Well, for one, purity. 
Tura limestone is super pure, like 95% calcium carbonate. The casing stones, they consistently test lower, sometimes under 90%. Interesting. So not quite the same material, chemically speaking. Doesn't seem to be, no. It suggests they aren't just blocks cut straight from that quarry source. Something else is mixed in, or they were processed differently. And wasn't there something else weird found? Not just purity. Uh-huh. Air bubbles. Tiny little voids within the stone structure, which you don't typically see in dense natural limestone formed over millennia. Air bubbles. Yeah. It sounds more like concrete or something man-made. It certainly points that way. But then there's the kicker. They also found hydroxyepatite. Hydroxy? What now? Hydroxyepatite. It's essentially a uh, calcined bone, calcium phosphate, the stuff your teeth and bones are made of. Wait, bone? In the pyramid casing stones? Seriously. Seriously. The author even connects this to some other research they did on ancient structures, finding similar materials. It's definitely not something you expect in natural limestone. Okay, that's, that's really weird. What does finding bone material mean? Well, it strongly reinforces the idea that these casing stones aren't just natural Tura limestone. It points very strongly towards them being some kind of manufactured artificial stone, a geopolymer or early concrete. Which loops back perfectly to the author's experiments and their second big theory, right? About the binder in the casing stones. Exactly. If the inner blocks were potentially water vulnerable, maybe made with natron. Then the outer protective casing stones needed a waterproof binder. Right, and based on the experiment where the ass lie potassium hydroxide sample held up perfectly in water. The theory is that that's what they use for the casing stones, mm. making them water resistant. That's the hypothesis. The potassium-based binder created a much more durable waterproof stone compared to the potentially water-soluble natron-based one used for the core. It's like using a weatherproof sealant on the outside of a building. So two different artificial stone recipes. Right. One cheaper or easier for the bulk inside, and a tougher, waterproof one for the crucial outer layer. That makes a lot of sense functionally. It provides a very practical reason for the difference in quality and composition beyond just, let's make it look shiny. Is there any way to prove this? To check for that potassium binder? Well, the author notes it's tricky without, you know, flying to Egypt with equipment. But they point out there is a casing stone fragment in the National Museum of Scotland. Ah, so they put out a call basically. Pretty much. An open invitation for anyone with access to an XRF scanner to go test that fragment specifically for potassium. That could be a key piece of evidence. Okay, let's recap then. We started with the gleaming white pyramids, purely for show. Right, the traditional view. But the experiments suggest a potential weakness in a natron-based artificial stone core needing protection. Which makes a waterproof outer layer critical. Then Mirror's diary hints they might have been collecting raw materials, not finished blocks, from Tura. Suggesting on-site manufacturing. And the chemical analysis shows the casing stones aren't pure Tura limestone. They have bubbles, impurities, even bone, suggesting they are artificial. And potentially used a different potassium-based binder to make them waterproof, unlike the core. Wow. Okay, the aha moment really is that water resistance test, isn't it? Yeah. It provides a solid functional reason for those high quality casing stones. It does. It shifts the perspective from pure aesthetics to sophisticated practical engineering, protecting the main structure from water damage. So the final thought for you listening. Yeah. If the ancient Egyptians were potentially using these advanced artificial stone techniques, maybe even different types for different purposes. Yeah, what else don't we know? What other assumptions about their construction methods might need a second look? It definitely makes you wonder about the level of chemical and material science knowledge they might have had, much more than just quarrying and stacking blocks, perhaps. It certainly opens up fascinating possibilities. If you're intrigued, definitely look up Joseph Deviditz and his work on geopolymers and ancient Egypt. There's a lot more to explore there.